everyone. So I don't know about you, but I feel like this year has been flying by for me. My boy Pascal is now six months old, started off as a chunky baby around the start of COVID. And now he's a big chunky boy. Looks like he's almost ready to crawl. Now, he's been a pretty good baby. The only problem is that he does his fair share of crying. Like last week, there was a night when he was crying a lot. We'd fed him, changed him, held him. He was still crying. So we put him down and just hoped that he would stop. He didn't stop. So he just kept going for another 10, 15 minutes of crying. And finally, I had an idea. I figured, well, Pascal likes my face. And he likes grabbing things. So I'm just going to let him grab my face. Because desperate times call for desperate measures. So I went to his crib, just dangled my face two inches on top of his. And that got his attention, and he started playing with my face, and it calmed him right down. The only problem was that I forgot where his hands had been, because he likes to put his hands in his mouth to soothe himself. And since he was crying himself, there was also a lot of snot. So suddenly my whole face was super slimy, and it was like super gross. But he stopped crying, and I got some free moisturizer. That's dad life. It's kind of hard. I think one of the keys to making it as a dad is just accept that it's going to be hard and we're going to be zombies and we're going to have to listen to the same musical toys until they drive us crazy. And all dads who want to be hands-on have to go through this. So one dad wrote, My kid once woke me up in the middle of the night to tell me not to cut pineapple slices too thick. We did not have any pineapple in the house at that time. Another dad wrote, my son can now reach the light switches, so you don't come over to my house until you're really into raves or want to have a seizure. I find it really funny to laugh at other dads. Just going through it myself is something else. But that said, I want to talk about something a little bit different today. Not so much about dad life, but the Christian life. I want to ask, does the Christian life have to be hard? I think it's a really important question because a lot of Christians try to find a way out of the difficulty because it's so hard. But if it's inevitably hard, then the strategy changes. If it's inevitably hard, then we just have to make the most out of it. We don't have to try to be comfortable because it's impossible. But instead, we look for a reason to get past the suffering and we equip ourselves with the resources to succeed. And so our Bible story today answers our big question. Does it have to be so hard? Our Bible story is about two brothers, Cain and Abel. So Cain and Abel were the first children of Adam and Eve. They were born right after their parents messed up in the garden. And at this point in the story, sin had entered the world, but not everything was broken yet. Everyone still had a relationship with God. But as we'll see, Cain and Abel had two different kinds of a relationship with God, and we're meant to learn from these two kinds of relationship. So I'll read our main passage to you from Genesis 4, 2 to 7. It says, Now Abel kept flocks, and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel brought also an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry, and his face was downcast. Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right... Sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. That's Pascal again in the distance, if you hear him. When we reflect on this passage, we find the Christian life has to be hard for two reasons. The first reason is that the Christian life demands our best effort. The Bible tells us that Cain and Abel both went to a place of worship to give an offering to God. And we have to understand that this offering wasn't just some gift, not some spontaneous freebie, but the Hebrew word for offering has more of a sense of a tribute. It's a formal token of devotion and loyalty and respect 
to their king. And Abel gave a really extravagant offering to God. Abel, Abel was a shepherd and he gave God his biggest, fattest sheep, his most favored animal. It's like when Edna gives me her favorite stuffed animal. She got this animal from Auntie Rebecca for her third birthday, this little stuffed penguin. And Edna immediately fell in love with it, and so she brings it all over the house. Uh, the penguin watches us eat, watches us go to the washroom. And at the end of the day, a penguin has to be in bed with Edna or else she won't sleep. So there's nights when I'm looking all over the house with the penguin, and I'm thinking, curse you, Rebecca, why'd you give me another animal to look for? But it's kind of worth it. Sometimes Edna holds her penguin out to me and it's this special moment where she's giving me her most prized possession because I'm her friend and she trusts me. There's a sense that her penguin is safe with me. The Bible tells us Abel had that kind of relationship with God. He had the mindset that God had given him everything and God would take care of him even if Abel gave to God his very best. He'd always have enough as long as he had God. And so there was a cheerfulness and a willingness in this offering. There's a kind of happiness that comes from giving a gift to someone you love. Well, then there was Cain's offering. Cain was a farmer, so he gave God some of his grain. Nothing wrong with that. And Cain had worked hard for his grain and now he was giving it some, of it some of it to God because he was supposed to. So here it was. The passage is written in a way to contrast the two offerings that the brothers made. It's kind of like if you run into two friends you haven't seen for a while and like one of them is like, hi, and they drop everything and they give you a big hug. And the other friend is like, Hi. Doesn't look happy at all to see you. And there's a difference there. And Cain and Abel were like that in terms of their difference to their approach to God. The Bible tells us that God looked with favor on Abel's offering. It was like God is so interested in Abel's offering. Look at this sheep, it's awesome. And God totally ignored Cain's offering because he had rejected it which tells us God is not a Canadian. Because as a rule, Canadians are more polite than that. Canadians are, Canadians are so polite that we have documentation of Canadians running into furniture and apologizing to the furniture because we're supposed to be polite like that. And in the Canadian culture, if someone gives you a gift you're supposed to say thank you. It's a really nice gift, even if you want to like, throw the gift away. But in the Chinese culture, there are moments when it's okay to criticize a gift. There's this Chinese lady, her name was Amy. She was one of those tough Asian moms. One day it was Amy's birthday, so her four-year-old daughter made her a card. His daughter presented this card to Amy. It was this piece of paper folded in half. In the front was this smiley face written in crayon. Inside it was written this simple message, Happy birthday, Mommy. Love, Lulu. And Amy looked at this card. She said, I don't want this. I want a better one. One that you've put some thought and effort into. So many years later, Amy published this story in a book, and it was this memoir about extreme Asian parenting, how she brought up her kids in this super strict way. And people all over North America started reading this book, and people were horrified that she would reject a card like that from her four-year-old daughter. By the time the book was out, the daughter was grown up and she responded in an open letter. She explained her card had only taken her 30 seconds to make. She hadn't tried. She wasn't hurt when it was rejected. She just knew she was busted. I think it was right that Amy rejected the card because she was teaching her daughter. It was not an honor to receive a card like that. It wasn't good for the daughter, it wasn't good for anyone if her gifts showed a complete lack of interest. And especially from a Christian point of view, it's important for children to honor their parents, honor their mothers, because it gives the child 
the best chance at a long life and a happy life. And so it was right that Amy rejected the card and told her to write a better one for Lulu's own sake. And that's the kind of thing that's going on in our Bible passage. God rejected Cain's offering because it was God's way of helping Cain. God didn't need the grain. It's not like God eats it. But God, the Cain needed to give his best out of faith and friendship. And if he did, he'd be blessed for it. And that's how it works for us as well. A lot of people don't understand this, but we have a God who rejects our leftovers. God rejects our offerings that cost us nothing. And so as we go to our place of worship, we find ourselves in the same shoes as Cain and Abel. You know, nowadays, a lot of churches are meeting online, and I hear that Christians all over the place are struggling to engage. It's so distracting to worship from home, and I definitely agree, it's not ideal. And I can't wait till this pandemic is over and we can all be together again. The Bible talks about meeting together and not giving up meeting together because it's like so important. And for a lot of people, their relationship with God is really taking a dive because it's so much harder to be a Christian. But if you're having a hard time with church, I want to ask you, do you really need to be at church in person before you worship God? Do you need the worship t teams to sing songs that you like? Do you need the singers to sing in tune, the musicians to make beautiful sounds? Do you need the sermons to be funny and engaging before you hear God's words for you? Of course, these things are nice, and we'll keep doing our best to provide these things. And overall, I'm so proud of our volunteers and our staff for, for producing at the level that they have because it's better than I ever could have asked for. But we all know we don't need other people to make it easy for us before we worship God. So let's not fool ourselves by making excuses that our environment makes it hard to have a relationship with God. Because if you wait till it's easy to worship, I want you to know that God rejects your casual offering. And He rejects it not because He hates you, but precisely the opposite, because He loves you and He wants better for you. Most Christians have no idea how much joy could come from a good relationship with God if they make the sacrifices. Most Christians have no idea how important that they are to history, how much change they can make to literally thousands of lives if they could just accept a little bit more discomfort, try a little bit more and give their best. Most Christians don't have a clue as to the joy that they could have if they obey the most important commandment in the Bible and actually love God with a whole heart and all of our strength. But God knows. God knows that we, if we give Him our best, we ourselves are the first to benefit. And so He rejects our casual offerings because He wants something better for us. And so now is the time to give God a costly offering. Now is the season to bring your mind and your heart to church even when nobody is watching you. And Jesus tells us that your heavenly Father who sees what's done in secret will reward you. It's really important that you do your best to worship during the pandemic, especially when nobody's watching because you're setting yourself up to succeed after the pandemic. Because as it turns out, it's not a temporary season when you have to give your best to God. Every season is a time to give your best to God. And even when the pandemic is over and it becomes easy to concentrate again, you'll have to push yourself to give your best in another way. You'll have to fight the complacency in another way. And if you can do this at church, you'll also be able to succeed at home and in your workplace and your school as you represent God. It's definitely not easy to do that for God, but He promises us that whatever sacrifice we make for Him, He'll eventually give it back to us. And it'll be a hundred times better. And that wraps up our first point, which is that the Christian life is hard 
because it demands our best. Second reason why the Christian life is hard is because we have to fight against ourselves. By that I mean you have to do things you really don't feel like doing. Sometimes in my free time I like to watch YouTubes about Navy SEALs and the US military. SEALs have this reputation for being some of the toughest guys in the world. But the military makes it really hard to become a SEAL. Like first of all, only about 6% of the soldiers in the Navy are even fit enough to become candidates. And of those 6%, they go through about 8 months of SEAL training, which one person describes as just being tortured for 8 months straight because they go through injury and cold and sleep deprivations and instructors are always yelling at them. And only about a quarter of the candidates ever make it through the training, partially because it's so hard. And the other reason why so few make it is because it's so easy to quit. Like any time a guy wants to quit, they just have to drag their body to a bell, ring it three times and announce that they're quitting, and then they're done. They don't ever have to go into the water again and be sleep deprived and cold. They can have a nice meal and a shower and sleep for 16 hours, and everybody there knows that. So the entire time, all these guys are fighting their basic urge to be comfortable. And it takes a certain mindset to get through all that suffering. You know, one year there was a candidate by the name of John. John had this lifelong dream to become a SEAL, but he was struggling to pass one of the tests that they had during the training. It was a real simple test. They had this big swimming pool, and at the bottom of the pool, 14 feet down, there were some ropes they had, to tie, they had to tie together. So he had to tie a rope, go down up to the surface again, get one breath of air, then tie the next rope, and go back up, get one more breath of air, and the next, and the next. And if he tied all, all five, he would pass. But John kept running out of breath, like he couldn't do it. And so finally he was on his last attempt. Like if he didn't pass this time, he'd be out of the program. He'd never be a Navy SEAL, so the pressure was on. And he really tried. And he got the first four knots tied. That was just it. His body couldn't take it anymore. And the fifth knot, he drowned. And the instructor swam down got him back up on the, down the side of the pool, started doing CPR. And after a minute and a half of chest compressions, John spat up all the water, sat up. And the first words out of his mouth were, did I pass? And the instructor, he was getting his color back too because he got to keep his job. And the instructor said, yeah, man, you passed. John said, thank God, I finally got the last knot. And the instructor said, no, no, you didn't. Listen, I'm in a good mood, so I'll let you in on a secret. I don't care how many knots you can tie. That's not part of the curriculum. The instructor said, my job is to see how far you'll push yourself. You just killed yourself, so you passed the test. That's the kind of mindset that SEALs have to have. The mindset that they will die before they quit. And that's why SEALs can perform at super high levels. And that's why they can be trusted with the most difficult missions because they've learned to do things they don't like doing, but they know it's worth it. These are people who win the battle in their mind. And that's what Cain had to do in our Bible story. The Bible tells us Cain was angry because God had accepted his brother's offering, but not Cain's. And you can imagine Cain was jealous and disappointed and bitter, all these negative feelings. Like Cain was angry enough to kill someone. God spoke to Cain, and God told him he could do one of two things. Cain could do what was right and be accepted. But if he didn't do what was right, sin was crouching at his door. Sin was like this vicious animal that was ready to eat him alive, and Cain had to fight it. The only problem was that he couldn't get rid of that animal because that animal was him. He had to fight himself. 
And that's how it has to work for every Christian. It certainly works like that for me. Every day I have to fight my own sinful nature. I get dark thoughts and temptations all the time. I think no matter how far you get as a Christian, you always have to do that. Like Even the Apostle Paul had to fight himself, and he's pro- possibly the greatest Christian who ever lived. So we should expect to see darkness in our own hearts, and we shouldn't be surprised by darkness and evil thoughts in our own heart. But we still have to fight it. And we have to learn from people who are good at fighting themselves. You know, if you want to find someone who's good at fighting themselves, maybe the best place to look is Alcoholics Anonymous. Because if you think about it, everybody at Alcoholics Anonymous is there because they want to fight themselves. Because they all realize that they have this horrible habit that would destroy their lives and hurt the people that they love. And this good side of them is trying to keep it under control. And so Alcoholics Anonymous is a specialized organization for helping people fight themselves. And one of their techniques is to use a diagnostic tool. It's just this acronym that people carry around in their head. It's called HALT, H-A-L-T. It stands for Hungry, Angry, Lonely, Tired. They say that when you're hungry, angry, lonely, or tired, that's when you should watch out because that's when you lose the willpower to resist the darkness. And as it, learned, as it turns out, this isn't just some idea that someone dreamed up, but the Bible teaches the same thing, that we are vulnerable when we're hungry, angry, lonely, and tired. It gives us so many examples. Like the Israelites, they lost faith after their, they crossed the Red Sea because they were hungry. Cain killed Abel later in our chapter because he was angry. Elijah gave up because he was lonely. The disciples crumbled under pressure in Gethsemane because they were tired. These stories were put in the Bible to teach us that we have those same vulnerabilities because we're made out of the same stuff. And so we take seriously our hunger, our anger, our loneliness, our tiredness. We get ourselves out of those compromising situations. Some of us need to develop better eating habits. Some of us need to forgive. Some of us need to get a really good conversation, a deep conversation. And some of us need to save time by quitting the things that distract us so we can get some rest. And if you can do these kinds of things, you can equip the good side of you to come out on top in this mortal struggle against yourself. You'll have the willpower to do these things that are worth doing. And he'll give a worthy offering to God and he'll honor your offering and multiply and increase your joy. And that wraps up my second point. I'll conclude by summarizing everything I've said and then I'll pray for us. So in summary, the Christian life is just hard. <laughs> it's hard because God only accepts what the best of what we have talking about our best effort for him every day. If you give him your best effort every day, he'll lead you in this life of radical love and sacrifice and hardship. I'm talking about doing things that nobody else is willing to do, but God has given you eternal life so you can give this life away. The Christian life has to be so hard, but it's worth it. And we can get the willpower to do what's hard if we take care of ourselves when we are hungry angry, lonely, and tired. If we can just follow Jesus and not give up, we can expect to help literally thousands of people. And whatever sacrifices we make to God, He'll give it back to us eventually. And it'll be a hundred times better. Let's pray. God, make us people of radical love. Help us to follow you through the difficulty to give you a costly offering. Bless our small offerings of willpower that we give to you and increase our joy. In Jesus' name, amen.